Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to speak on telehealth best practices uh, as part of this COVID response. I can't think of a better time to be talking about this, this topic. Part of what we'll be talking about uh, in best practices will be informed by evidence. Uh, and we had a recent systematic review published in the Green Journal in uh, February this year about telehealth interventions in both obstetrics, uh, primarily obstetrics, but also gynecology. So we'll be covering a lot of information on this. I have no financial disclosures to declare, but I do have some acknowledgements. And we can't possibly be talking about physicians and their interaction with digital space right now without acknowledging how different life is at present. Uh, your life socially and personally may look something like this. And even professionally, it probably looks like what former president, uh, Dr. Mark DeFrancesco is modeling here. Virtual visits being conducted in uh, the privacy of, of your home. We, on the you know, internet searching, will come across all these memes. Uh, some iconic that will be with us for a while. Some are uh, on more serious nature, uh, but not all humorous, because obviously this is a serious topic that we're dealing with. One way to approach any topic, uh, may have been coined by Ernest Hemingway, it's not, not clear, but is this idea of a six word story. You know, what's the six word COVID story right now? And on Twitter, uh, some ACOG leadership have actually uh, chimed in on this. With, with some uh, you know, very uh, kind of inspiring stories here. So COVID responses shouldn't reinforce existing inequities. And there have been some very clever uses of new vernacular, especially hashtags, where you can kind of fit three words into one, uh, 2019, stop the bans, 2020, hold my beer. So they got me thinking, what, what is my uh, six word story for COVID? And is there any connection to telehealth about it? And I think, the story that keeps coming back to me over and over is in 2020, I worked with heroes and they're all around us. Uh, and many of these obviously are in the hospital, but some are also in the clinic. And in all respects, this uh, will be a, a defining time in, in most of our lives. And so this lecture here is to try to help all these heroes make life a little bit easier by taking some of the work uh, outside of the, the front lines in the hospital or the clinic and doing it uh, where it's a little bit safer at home. The work on telehealth uh, by ACOG is really not new. Uh, this has been going on for uh, several years. And one of the main building blocks was uh, during Dr. Haywood Brown's presidential initiative to remodel prenatal and postpartum care. And one way we did this, uh, approach this was through telehealth uh, and new technology. So that, that created the telehealth presidential task force, which later on became the telehealth working group. And the culmination of all that work uh, were publications in February in the Green Journal. We, of course, had no idea this timing was going to be so uh, perfect for building a response to something like a global pandemic. But as it turns out, uh, you know, these are both published kind of right as COVID was breaking. And we have two publications. One is the ACOG Committee Opinion on Implementing Telehealth and Practice. This at one point was referred to as our uh, how-to document. Uh, because basically it gives nuts and bolts for how you implement telehealth in your practice. Now, a lot of that will look different right now in a uh, temporary emergency response because of all the waivers. And I know there are um, lectures after this on, on billing and coding, and they'll cover some of those, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we'll talk about it a little bit. And then we have a, a systematic review where uh, this, this independent expert author group reviewed the evidence and uh, found situations where uh, there really actually is some, some good data to guide us on how we can use telehealth. But we'll start with the committee opinion. And you may hear these definitions come up. So I want to kind of set this is the, the groundwork uh, here. The box one of that document uh, gives all these definitions. But I want to call attention to the ones here uh, that I've pulled out, which is synchronous and asynchronous. Now, synchronous uh, will mean live and in telehealth, it will typically mean live audiovisual. So it's basically uh, what you would do if you were uh, Skyping or FaceTiming a friend, or more likely now, doing a probably HIPAA compliant virtual visit, uh, where it's real time audiovisual. That's in contrast to other things uh, such as store and forward, which would be asynchronous. So you get the information from the patient at one point in time, and then you uh, evaluate it or work it into your care at a later point. So one example of this uh, that we're very familiar with would be blood glucose monitoring, which has been done for actually several decades in some form of patient-generated data without real-time interventions, 
Uh, now with technology, we have um, you know, many more options for how we monitor and, and manage glucose, but most of, most of the time it's done as a store and forward. The patient collects the data, it is uh, you know, either captured in their device or it's sent via Wi-Fi to, to a cloud, and then at a later time you evaluate it. Now sometimes these terms can actually overlap. So for example, in this uh, picture that I have here, it's a blood pressure cuff that is linked via either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to, um, to the, the cloud. And the blood pressures are taken, and typically when they're normal, they're not evaluated real time. But if a blood pressure trigger occurs, uh, which would be an elevated blood pressure, you can choose your own settings here, but most it would be 140 over 90 at least, and then maybe a different kind of trigger at, at higher blood pressures. That prompts a either call to a nurse triage line or routing to the on-call doctor. Uh, you can choose your, your method, but basically this goes from a uh, typically store and forward to a real-time intervention. Uh, this example I'm using here is baby scripts, which uh, we use in Washington, D.C., but, but there are numerous examples that would do something like this. So a bit about the billing, licensure, security, and technology, uh, especially as it comes up to new information that is addressed in the uh, telehealth FAQs. And by the way, a lot of the information that I'm going to reference here is relevant to the FAQs, which, which are the brand new, uh, you know, almost updated weekly or certainly frequently uh, for the COVID response. And one of the questions about HIPAA compliance, and there's all this text here, but uh, if you're asking, you know, what recent federal regulatory changes might apply, your eyes might have jumped at FaceTime and Skype, because those are things that, that many people, almost everyone, has access to. And uh, you might be very anxious to use these. And, and those are, are allowed during this waiver period. I would recommend, if we're talking about best practices here, to still look for HIPAA compliance uh, as the preferred route. Now, many practices may already be doing this uh, because we've had to rapidly build up telehealth. But if you're at a point where you're, we're you know, still considering uh, building what will become a more long-standing part of your practice, you may as well start with HIPAA compliant one because these waivers right now are temporary. Uh, they will certainly go away someday. And maybe some of the allowances will uh, you know, go on after this, but there's no guarantee. And, and most likely, uh, a majority of them will go back to the pre-COVID time. However, what is not likely to go back to pre-COVID is uh, you know, the, the um, kind of separation of telehealth. The people who are using it, uh, both providers and especially patients, are really taking to it. And th this is uh, national sampling from uh, multiple disciplines of medicine, so it's not a formal survey, but, but it does have enough respondents that it's a pretty decent uh, barometer. 40% uh, of the virtual visits being conducted right now are for non-COVID related uh, questions. So ongoing care in GYN, it might be annual exams, counseling, and OB, it might be prenatal care. And so what we likely see going forward is not uh, you know, between telehealth and in-person care in either or decision, but probably a blended hybrid model. And so if you're building something now, you uh, may as well, or you might do well to uh, have it be compliant with HIPAA, because certainly that is one that will not uh, last after the COVID response. For some of the tutorials on, on etiquette, uh, many of them are common sense and, and you know, you might, you might uh, you know, be perfectly fine doing your visits without, without all these tutorials, but some of them are actually very helpful, especially when it comes to the basic etiquette. And there are things that you may not think about because it is different doing a visit virtually rather than in person. So for example, in person, you would probably never be texting somebody while you're talking to a patient, or if you did, you would certainly say, excuse me, I really have to respond to this. But I will tell you, just last week I was doing a virtual visit and uh, almost slipped into this. So I, I think it's very easy for us to do some things um, that would be considered faux pas that uh, tutorials like this can help you be aware of and, and just make your visits a little more professional. The other thing that's in this telehealth document on uh, the committee opinion that I want to talk about a little bit, in addition to the definitions and the, the basics, uh, is the fact that there are many codes, specific codes, listed here for billing for all that hard work that you do. And I know that you're going to have a whole uh, kind of session on the telehealth codes that are part of this uh, COVID response. But again, as you, as you build this infrastructure for something likely going forward, I would just call your attention to this uh, so you, you get reimbursed for all that hard work you're doing. Now for the real question that, that we get uh, most often through uh, personally through texts and emails and, and that I think is on everyone's mind, how can I use this for OBGYN visits? And since this is best practices, we'd like to start with the evidence. 
And so here we're going to uh, go for the systematic review. But I again will reference the FAQs uh, for telehealth as uh, kind of setting some parameters. So the first is that for all of these uh, studies we're going to talk about in the systematic review, while they were vetted very thoroughly, so they, they had to have uh, you know, uh, substantial methodology, they needed a control. So we didn't uh, look at pilot studies or feasibility studies. They had to, uh, so therefore, either be an observational with control or a randomized controlled trial. They had to look at, it, at what we considered an important health outcome. All of that said, they mostly were equivalency or non-inferiority studies. So they were asking, you know, is this uh, at least as good as or no worse than standard of care? The other thing is that there were, there were so many studies, uh, frankly, very interesting and fascinating studies that didn't meet inclusion here, but, but they were topics that, that do actually have some evidence and might be considered uh, reasonable to uh, you know, look at during an emergency response. The key questions that the systematic review looked at were if telehealth was an effective adjunct or alternative to standard of care for lower risk obstetrics, high risk obstetrics, family planning, and uh, a variety of gynecology uh, conditions. When we looked at what counted as a telehealth intervention, because this can be a very broad definition, we decided that we wanted the most novel uh, interventions to be most relevant to this time. And when I say this time, obviously we were not talking about a pandemic response uh, back when we were designing this. We were talking about, uh, you know, kind of the, the, modern, the modern era of telehealth. So what would people consider new enough that they might uh, be looking for new data on whether it's effective? And so that counted things like uh, wearable devices, especially linked to a mobile app. It included, of course, real-time audiovisual visits. We did include text messaging. That may feel almost a little bit old at this point, but we considered it novel enough, and it was uh, mostly accessed through a smartphone, so we counted that. Uh, while it's extremely valuable, we did not include uh, things that were just telephone calls. And it's not to say there's no place for that. Obviously, it's a huge part of what we do, but we just didn't think that was like, the novel telehealth questions. And then anything that was simply based on a computer or even internet intervention. So in other words, if you directed your patient to a website to look at, or uh, in the case of this computer here, you may have given them a floppy disk or a CD-ROM. Uh, again, while that has certainly some utility, we decided that wasn't uh, part of the new wave of interventions. So let's get right into it. Uh, looking at low risk obstetrics, we had uh, 1,700 or so references screened, uh, 19 studies met our inclusion. The themes that were looked at were uh, smoking cessation, uh, vaccine uptake, especially influenza vaccination, pregnancy wellness, which was kind of an umbrella term for healthy eating, physical activity, and maternal weight gain, uh, and breastfeeding. And what we found was that while there wasn't much evidence to make any kind of uh, statement on vaccine uptake or pregnancy wellness, there was some moderate evidence to point to improved smoking cessation, uh, in this case via text message responses or text message interventions uh, that's based on four randomized control trials. And that, that these same kind of interventions did have significant improvement for exclusive breastfeeding or breastfeeding continuation rates. They might be saying that's, that's great, but that really is not my top priority right now to the COVID response. Totally agree. So, what we want to look at is how can you take those lessons and perhaps consider some alternatives during an emergency response. And this uh, again comes from the FAQs, uh, I think it's in a few places, which is that you, know, you can't really talk about telehealth and obstetrics uh, without talking about an altered prenatal care schedule. And there are uh, numerous examples listed in the FAQs about how you might design uh, an alternate schedule for this, um, this right now period. One would be spacing out appointments, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean changing the number of visits per se, but changing uh, the times of visits, so there's fewer people there at once. Uh, but of course, that would include uh, alternate prenatal care schedules. And there's some examples of how that can be incorporated. Also, on the postpartum side, oh, and, and just to go back to the second, the, the obvious um, telehealth, uh, inclusion here is that in between these in-person visits, you can do virtual check-ins, and that can be everything from a real-time audiovisual visit to uh, collecting data from, um, you know, remote monitoring with patient-generated data, uh, and and we'll get into what those examples look like. The other thing is that on the postpartum side, we, we do have our uh, optimizing postpartum care committee opinion from 2018, and the the top text is the one that I think uh, grabbed everyone's attention right away, which is 
All women, ideally, should have some kind of follow-up within three weeks postpartum. The rest of this text might not have been as front of mind uh, until right about now, which is this assessment need not occur as an office visit. So additional mechanisms would be telephone support, text messages, remote blood pressure monitoring, app-based support. And while it's not um, yet settled data, there's mixed evidence for, for some um, support to reduce depression scores, improve breastfeeding outcomes, and increase patient satisfaction. This kind of ties into uh, the high-risk obstetrics, especially on blood pressure monitoring. So in this category, we had uh, about 1,200 references screened, 14 studies were included, and the telemedicine interventions were looked at for conditions like diabetes, hypertension, uh, as well as patients at risk for preterm labor and asthmatics. The overall theme, uh, which, which I'll highlight here for one of the diabetic studies, is that there was no difference in maternal or neonatal outcome, so no difference in glycemic control. However, that same equivalent outcome was achieved with fewer outpatient appointments. Uh, and this was seen kind of across the board for each of these topics. Another uh, feature of telehealth that, that you often see is that while there may not be an objective clinical outcome that has changed, there are subjective measures that are improved. So in the case of asthmatics, which would be something of high interest right now, um, obviously any pregnant woman is considered you know, something at higher risk during COVID, uh, you know, whatever the comorbidities might be, but especially pulmonary ones would, would be on attention right now. So for, for pregnant women with asthma, they, there was no objective change in their pulmonary functions. However, they reported that the telehealth group reported uh, improved subjective asthma control um, and asthma-related quality of life. So these are some things you might think about implementing in your high-risk uh, practices. Now, you might also be wondering if we're gonna talk about NSTs, right? That's one of the more obvious things to think about, can we do this remotely? We are not going to get into that. Uh, telehealth may have answers someday, but at this point, we, we can't answer that question confidently. Uh, so we're not gonna do that. You might also be aware of these uh, really numerous app devices, uh, whether it's the microphone of the phone itself that is pressed on the woman's belly, uh, or it's a plug-in device to try and monitor the fetal heart rate, that these, these are out there. And, uh, you know, while we don't have any specific comment on, you know, whether you may want to have some way to assess uh, fetal heart tones during a visit, uh, there are currently no waivers from the FDA about these kind of devices that I'm showing here, that the app, the app plug-ins. Uh, so that's not a waiver that's, that's been granted. And uh, there are other devices that, uh, you know, have previously received FDA approval. The telehealth uh, text here is that, you know, while the real-time audiovisual communication uh, has been used for scenarios like peer-to-peer -peer consultation, ultrasound image review, and directed physical exams. So you can use some discretion there, but uh, we do want to highlight, you know, that, that not all waivers um, have, have been granted for all things. Also in high-risk obstetrics on the postpartum side, uh, but it really, you know, could be extrapolated to um, to any kind of blood pressure monitoring for high-risk patients, we do have a fair amount of, of studies on, on blood pressure monitoring. So these are two that are mentioned in the uh, postpartum committee opinion. And the, the kind of overall uh, sense of it was that there was, there was feasibility for these to uh, meet compliance with the ACOG guidelines, which would be at least one reading on day one or two, and then on uh, between, five, between days five and seven. Uh, again, on, on the patient satisfaction side, patients uh, reported that it showed promise as a convenient and effective means on uh, the immediate postpartum period. And the patients who used these showed um, lower levels of, of perceived technological barriers, uh, higher facilitating condition scores, and higher levels of perceived benefit. On the um, low risk side, so again, this is, this is not the high risk patients anymore, but it's the same, same idea of of antepartum and postpartum blood pressure monitoring. These are, are figures that were presented at ACOG the last two years. And not only was it feasible, but it was feasible at large scale. And, and there um, were, were certainly useful information in these. So we have, uh, in this case, uh, 24,000 antepartum blood pressure recordings for low-risk women and about 300 uh, postpartum blood pressure readings in the postpartum period. Uh, and again, that was using this Wi-Fi and um, uh, Bluetooth linked blood pressure cuff uh, from baby scripts. In family planning, the text message interventions uh, did not show any benefit. Oh, sorry, we, we had 500 uh, references screened and, and 13 studies were included. Uh, 
the, the text message interventions didn't really show any benefit for uh, improving uh, contraception use or follow-up after a medical abortion. However, there was some use that there were, you know, perhaps some nudges to continue uh, a, a behavior that was already ongoing. So modern evidence that these text messages were promoting continued use of oral and injectable contraception. And uh, perhaps most relevant to, to this time right now, there was moderate evidence that the telemedicine interventions for medical abortion services uh, were similar to in-person standard of care, but because they were virtual, uh, the patients had improved access to, to early services. Within the GYN group, uh, we screened 1,300 studies, eight were included. Uh, those eight were spread over about six different topics. So we really had limited evidence to make any kind of conclusions on those since most topics only had one study. But the kind of things that were being explored were uh, text messages to talk about STI results, uh, app-based monitoring for urinary incontinence symptoms, and then even some telehealth tools like virtual visits for post-op recovery, including uh, GYN post-op recovery. And when we talk about GYN specialties, we really have to uh, mention, even though it was not, again, in the systematic review, this, this massive area of utilization, uh, which is you know, the category that is either pregnancy, but really more commonly the menstrual tracking, fertility awareness apps. Uh, based on this study in 2013, it was found to be even more popular than other fitness apps, uh, so other uh, step counters, which, which is really remarkable <laughs> considering how, generally speaking, um, you know, how, how many more people might be using other fitness apps. Uh, studies vary whether this ranks one or two, but, but either way, this is really a, an area of high utilization. And so, uh, you know, from our, again, from our FAQs that, that have just been published recently, well, there's no specific guidance on which conditions that, that you know, we're not going to list every single possible condition to be used. Uh, there are many elements of GYN, GYN care, uh, including the annual exam, that could be conducted with virtual counseling sessions. And then the in-person exam could be either deferred to a later time or done, or done you know, as a follow-up on an as-needed basis. If people are taking screenshots of this presentation, I don't know if that's even you know, possible, but this is a, a table that's also available online, but uh, this was kind of the overall summary of our findings from the systematic review uh, that I just discussed. For some additional resources, you could look to uh, the Center for Telehealth and E-Law, CTEL. They've been a valuable source of information. Uh, the Center for Connected Health Policy uh, gives uh, very up-to-date information, for example, on which states are doing uh, which waivers, and I, I mentioned learntelehealth.org. Uh, I'd like to give a, a huge thank you to everyone who worked on the uh, either telehealth presidential task force, uh, the working group, or part of our expert consultant groups. Uh, really just a, a, a awesome amount of work in, in a relatively short amount of time. And of course, we're, we're telehealth, so there are numerous ways to reach me, but uh, please feel free to contact me on my email or on Twitter. I'm also on the other social media uh, platforms with, with a similar handle. So thank you so much for the opportunity here to talk about telehealth and look forward to our next meeting, uh, hopefully in person, hopefully not too long from now. Thank you.